natural state. It collapses to some unnatural state. And then the shape of the protein inside the cell is different, and it doesn't couple to the same uh, effectors with the same efficiency that it had before. So there may be a different subset of signaling. So this is called functional selectivity. It's gaining uh, popularity in pharmacology as everyone realizes this really is what happens, is that different things happen depending on what binds to the receptor. It's not an on and off switch. Something binds and then something always happens inside. It's, it's adaptable and lots of different things can happen depending on what the molecule is you put in there. So what's the difference between 2CB, 2CI, DOI, DOB? These are probably related to functional selectivity, first of all. But there are really subtle factors that you can't account for. For example, I've told people, suppose you have two drugs, drug A and drug B. And if we looked at all the brain receptors that they could activate, and the efficiency with which they could turn on all the different biochemical signals within all the cells, and these two drugs were absolutely completely identical in that function. But one of them was more fat-soluble than the other. I believe they would have different effects because as the drug partitions into the brain, which is very fatty, has to cross the blood-brain barrier, depending on those partitioning properties, how it gets through different cell, body, cell membranes, drug A is going to get, say, to the cortex before it gets to the thalamus, and drug B is going to get to the amygdala before it gets to the hippocampus, before it gets to the cortex. And so even though they interact with the very same receptors with the same efficiency, et cetera, et cetera, that difference is going to mean those two drugs are different. And if you look at it pharmacologically, you say, well, I don't know why there's any difference, because you don't realize, well, if you could follow these drugs partitioning into the brain, this one has a different pattern than the other. So I don't think it's possible to understand, certainly not at the level of science that we have now, it's beyond our ability to understand why 2CI, say 2CB, is different, why those two are different, or you know, why BOI turns on this anti-inflammatory pathway, but other 2A agonists don't. Uh, so I can't tell you what it, what it is. It's, it has all the features of a 2A agonist, which is probably a necessary but not sufficient condition for its action. I consider turning on or activating the serotonin 2A receptor to be like turning on the switch of a television or a radio or something. And then all the other things it does is like you know, tuning it and adjusting the contrast and the brightness and the hue and the color and all that stuff. The 2A receptor is just like the on-off switch, in my opinion. That has to happen, but then the overall nature of the experience is related to all these other ancillary events that take place. That's just my opinion. What's very strange to me, just uh, briefly here, about 2CI, say, for instance, and compared to LSD, is 2CI has a very distinctly dark sort of experience related to it. Lots of eyes peering at you. Very, very bizarre experience compared to LSD and some of the other more traditional, uh, well, or some of the tryptamines. And obviously 2CI is not a, a tryptamine. But it's, uh, it's just such a bizarre sort of dark experience. And... I would think that there would be something in that experience, the darkness itself, that might even be interesting to study. Yeah, now do you find, do you know other people who have had similar experiences? I mean, is this a routinely reported thing with 2CI? I have heard other people tell me that uh, 2CI does seem to have some of that dark side to it, whereas uh, 2CB is much more closely related to, say, the MDMA experience. Yeah. Yeah, it's again, it's probably these ancillary interactions. You know, if you look at mescaline, for most people who have taken pure mescaline, it produces nausea and a lot of people just vomiting. And that's atypical. I mean, some people feel a little nauseous, but mescaline really does it. Well, I mean, what is that? What's involved there? And another thing we've been studying is, <clears throat> um, and Friedman, Danny Friedman first noticed this and, and, re and, and reported on it and actually told me about it several times. He did a lot of clinical studies with LSD, and for he said, Dave, for most of our subjects, we give them LSD, and for the first four or five hours, you know, it's great, it's psychedelic, it's very euphoric, you know, they like it. And then for, for most people, around the midpoint, it changes and gets very dark, and they get a paranoid ideation and ideas of reference, and it, it really resembles paranoid psychosis a lot. And there's something to this that I think is worth studying. And I've asked a lot of people over the years, like, when you, you've taken LSD, oh, yeah, you know, do you see this? And 
for most people, they say, yeah, you know, after four or five hours, it gets dark and weird, and I just want it to stop. But there is a population of people who say, oh, no, no, it's all the same all the way through. There's a individual variability. Well, we've done studies in rats now that suggest that there actually, in rats, there's a change in pharmacology. In the, if you give rats LSD in our behavioral studies for the first hour or so, it, the, the effect that they notice or they cue in on is the uh, activation of serotonin 2A receptors. But after about an hour or hour and a half, the effect of LSD involves activation of dopamine receptors. And of course, uh, dopamine has been implicated in psychosis. The best theory of schizophrenia and paranoid psychosis is the dopamine hypothesis of an overactivity of dopamine. So we think that for people who get this weird dark effect of LSD later on in the intoxication, that it somehow is involving uh, some sensitization of dopamine receptors, maybe the formation of a metabolite that has dopaminergic properties. Well, I think the same thing's possible, say, with mescaline. No one's ever looked at its ability to activate you know, dopaminergic receptors. And no one's looked at 2CI for the same reason. It's possible, and I, I'm just completely blue sky speculation here, it's possible that for some reason 2CI has affinity for, say, one of the dopamine D2-like receptors, which adds this sort of dark component to it. And it could be completely dependent upon the fact that, you know, it's the, the iota there rather than a bromo or something else. I'm speculating, but nobody has studied these in enough depth to really know for sure you know, what that effect could be. Do we want to go into how receptor sites change consciousness momentarily, or did we already cover enough of that? You know, that's we sort of have a black box understanding. To understand how they change consciousness, you have to understand consciousness itself. And that's the big issue now in cognitive neuroscience. I mentioned this 40 hertz oscillation, and they've shown that if there's a window of about 10 to 15 milliseconds for an individual event to be perceived. It's called a quanta of time. And that, that 10 to 15 milliseconds corresponds to what's called the uh, development of an upstate in a cortical neuron when it starts depolarizing. And when you look at that in the context of a firing rate, it leads to these 40 hertz uh, thalamocortical oscillations. So <clears throat> the current thinking, I think, for most people in the field is that consciousness is, a, is somehow produced by this, a thal uh, these thalamocortical circuits that oscillate at 40 hertz and produce these um, patterns of cortical firing. How does that produce consciousness? I don't have the faintest clue. Uh, it's, it's a reductionist approach, a very reductionist approach that just says it's all mechanistic. Um, but obviously, if you, have a, if you have a complicated organism, and the brain's the most complicated biological uh, device that we know of in the universe, it's, it's precisely tuned. Those cortical cells are operating at their critical point where they're on the verge of just falling into chaos. Everything is tightly regulated by a variety of inputs. These cortical cells get inputs from serotonergic serotonin inputs, norepinephrine inputs, dopamine inputs, acetylcholine inputs, GABA, glutamate. All these things are tightly regulated, so this thing is firing and allowing us to have a consensus con sort of reality consciousness. Obviously, if you perturb that, it's going to perturb consciousness. And when you activate serotonin 2A receptors on cortical cells and other places in the brain, you dramatically affect that electrical, uh, the electrical properties of cortical cells and their network connections. So it follows that then you're going to perturb consciousness. But how does consciousness arise from that, you know, thalamocortical oscillation? Nobody can, nobody can tell you. It's, you know, it's beyond our ability at the state of the art to even know. You know, that's assuming that consciousness is, you know, it's. It's all a function of the brain. You know, there's this whole other argument that you have this, you know, dual, you know, dual nature of, you know, some spiritual essence that's that survives death, and that's consciousness really, and the brain just kind of picks up on that. Or, you know, that's a whole other thing. I'm just talking about reduction of science as I as I'm allowed to talk about. <laughs> you know, this whole idea of oscillations that you keep mentioning, I can't help but go back. Every time you've said that word oscillation, I keep going back to my uh, trips to Grateful Dead shows and taking nitrous balloons and this bizarre wom 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 kind of thing that happens with 
with nitrous, this bizarre oscillation in the brain, is that at all related, or are we talking about w- way different concepts? I don't, you know, I don't really know. I mean, nitrous is a general anesthetic, and I really don't know how that would affect, you know, I mean, hearing is obviously sensory information, and, you know, I don't know what that frequency would be, uh, whether that's something that would be related to this. This quanta, this quanta of time, uh, this 10 to 15 milliseconds, I mean, you know, maybe that fits in. It's hard to say. And all of these, we just haven't studied consciousness enough. I mean, I'm just, I'm just groping in the dark. Uh, it may or may not be related. <laughs> All right. Well, the dark is liking it. Do you want to go back to Parkinson's for a minute uh, and go into that in a little bit more depth before we change pace here for a minute and wrap things up? Well, you know, I have this other area that I work in, uh, dopamine agonist. And I got into it years ago when I came to Purdue by working with a guy at University of Chicago named Leon Goldberg. He was looking for dopamine D1 type drugs. Uh, when you're in an accident and you bleed a lot, you lose a lot of blood, uh, you can go into hypovolemic shock. You've lost so much blood, you go into shock. And what happens is the blood vessels in your kidneys constrict to decrease the, the volume of your vascular system to try to raise blood pressure. And that's and that if you don't get blood in the kidneys, blood brings oxygen and glucose, the kidneys die. So you would have renal failure that was subsequent to hypovolemic shock. And dopamine D1 agonists dilate the renal arteries so that blood keeps flowing through there. So I worked with him developing these uh, D1 agonists, potential D1 stimulating drugs. And then um, I became aware it was much more interesting to look for these drugs in the brain. What did the D1 receptor do in the brain? And dopamine D1 receptors, 46% of all the dopamine receptors in the brain, almost 50% are D1 agonists. And they're thought to be involved in possibly in drug addiction, in working memory, cognition, but also in Parkinson's. And in Parkinson's disease, you basically have uh, cells in the brainstem in an area called the substantia nigra that die. And when they die, the dopamine projections that they send into an area called the striatum, they die too. And so you lose the dopamine that's being released in these areas of the brain called the striatum uh, that allow you to have voluntary motor movement, to move your arm and stand up and sit down, et cetera. You lose that. And when 80 or 85% of those cells die, you see the symptoms of Parkinson's. But it progresses and it goes on and on and on, and, and the cells continue to die until the patients basically can't move. And the current treatment is the administration of a drug called levodopa. It's dopa is a precursor for dopamine, and it gets into the brain. And in the uh, remaining cells that are in there, they take off the carboxy side chain of dopa, and that gives you dopamine. So they flood these cells with this precursor for dopamine, and so small amounts of dopamine are produced. But eventually, those cells all die, and there's no more enzyme left to convert the dopa into dopamine. But the receptors are still there, and because dopamine D2 type receptors were the first ones discovered and were involved in schizophrenia and so forth, everyone thought, well, D2 must be important in Parkinson's disease. And so they give these people ropinirol and uh, premipexil, mirapex, things like that, to try to stimulate these D2 receptors. And they only work early in Parkinson's disease and then they quit working because what, we sh- what we've shown is that it's the D1 receptors that are the ones that need to be stimulated. So we spent a lot of time, I have uh, six, I think, six patents on dopamine D1 drugs that stimulate D1 receptors. We showed in a study we published in 1991 in some monkeys that were being used by another investigator for some fetal transplantation work. We talked him into letting us give one of our dopamine D1 drugs to these monkeys. And he had some monkeys that completely could not move, two of them that uh, they had given too much of a toxin that killed dopamine cells. These monkeys couldn't move at all, hadn't been able to get up for a couple months, and basically nothing worked. And gave them this D1 drug that I developed, and the monkeys the monkeys got up, ate a banana. I mean, 